That, of course, is the power of the Spirit, and this is included in our words only through highly selected thought, thought which corresponds to the creative purposes of the universe. In that way, the will, which has directive ability, sends the word forth, but it is not the will that gives power to the spoken word. The will selects or enters into the selection of thought and the speaking of the word, but the power is conceded or admitted through an enlarged consciousness of the presence and power of spirit. But when a word is selected for its meaning or its use, it is always selected in the frequency where it belongs and is placed there. This should eliminate the fear which many have of negative words and at the same time should inspire the individual to a more intelligent selection of his words and how to put them to better use. To think the thoughts of God after him would be the essence of spiritual power, for back of such words would be the very power that created the heavens and the earth. Man's words should always be an outlet for his own innate spiritual nature and a means of establishing this spiritual nature in his outer being. To speak only in harmony with the highest and most constructive ideas would be to speak with the greatest power and in this way that which seems the greatest improbability would become the most probable in that such words have the greater power. In other words, the more godlike the thought, the realization and the consciousness, the greater the power involved in the process. As the Eastern philosophers express it, you could not be separated from principle one iota if you, were, if you would use selective words. Therefore, every word that is put out can be selective. Then you are not energizing a negative condition. You are only giving energy to that one conclusion. The Hindu or the Aaron always put it, Man is the creator of words, therefore man is the selector, or he has dominion over those words, and he selects or places words in existence which must operate or become potent. Now, in the measure that he uses this fact rightly, there is no way of connecting that power with negative words, as they put it. Consequently, negative words do not enter into or have any consideration from the individual who wishes to manifest forms. This thought of manifest form is always that condition brought into existence wherein man is able to create. That is where man has dominion over every word spoken. The Sanskrit language is one of its, in one of its phases allows for that condition there is in that the power to manifest. By that we mean that one position of the Sanskrit language allows only four positive words or statements. That is, words that can be made into positive statements, and from these there are no deviation. Naturally, everyone asks what those four positive words are. They are always words which mean the positive declaration of facts. Each one can select them. Of course, the most positive word in the world. No, of course, the most positive word is the first word, God. Going back to the principle, you would formulate your statement with that as a basis. You would formulate with that word whatever positive sentence you wished. Thereby is the power of the spoken word. Your key word is always the highest or God. Then you select the words which accompany that for your positive declaration. Just as all mathematical calculation springs from the units symbolized by the figure one, so must all words emanate from a single derivative or principle. God is, and because God is, I am. Because God is life, I am life. Because God is intelligence, I am intelligence. Because God is power, I am power. Because God is all substance, I am substance, etc. Father in Sanskrit means first mover, and the first movement of the mind of the individual must always emanate from the one source. 
and it must be sustained through the consciousness of the individual. To admit anything into the individual consciousness that does not originate in the facts of God is to adulterate the process of life in himself, and to this extent he becomes unaware of the fullness of his divinity. He must give himself to the underlying facts of life in their entirety. He must tarry at Jerusalem, his contact with the all, until the holy or entire spirit of God is the motivating energy of his every thought, word, and act. Man cannot express a word or thought outside of his own field of competency with any manifesting power. He cannot go outside of that field because that very word which he expresses creates the field in which he acts. The average person does not really know what a word is. It is merely a vehicle used in the process of mind to convey or extend certain processes of the mind. The word cannot convey that which is not in the mind. Webster says that a name implies the essential nature of a thing. A word is only a name for certain states of consciousness. And that is something that rests with the individual himself. One person may say, I am happy, and it would convey nothing to another individual hearing the word. If his consciousness is only a bit joyous, his words would convey but little authority. But if he were radiant with joy, his words would convey complete conviction. Idle words are empty words, words which do not contain the consciousness and realization of spiritual facts. You see, a word as we use it is just what it contains, and the content of the word is determined by our consciousness, and our consciousness is determined by the degree of intelligent selection which we use. It is not repetition that makes a word effective. Your first declaration, if it, is, if it be true, is sufficient. There is nothing left to do but stand by your statement, abide in your word. Repetition, however, is often an effective means of bringing one into accord with the possibilities contained within a statement. One often repeats a sentence or rule over and over before the meaning is clearly revealed to his consciousness. Without this expansion of the mind toward the inner facts, repetition is only hypnotic. If man repeats words and they do not become hypnotic to him, this repetition brings him into closer accord with the facts back of the words. It affects a higher realization. It is worthwhile to repeat up to a certain point, and then it is not worthwhile even to repeat because your word is established unto you. When you understand that your word is clearly established, repetition is of no more value whatever. In reality, we come to understand that our word is always established and we never repeat it. If the manifestation of your word does not appear, that is no proof of its ineffectiveness. The better policy in such a case is to give thanks that the manifestation is there. You get out of doubt completely in that way, but by going on and repeating your word, you may even get very quickly begin to engender doubt. Whereas if you give thanks, you are more closely in harmony with your word and become more easily aware that your word is established. The mere repetition of a word does not establish it any more firmly. It only brings you into harmony with that which is. It is very often possible to bring yourself into more harmonious relationship by giving thanks that it is here now and that it is established. When one realizes that the whole problem of manifest results in more a matter of opening up the consciousness to see or include something which already exists in fact, instead of trying to bring something that is not out into manifest form, then the matter will be much simpler. It is the land thou seest that will I give thee as an inheritance that contains all of the mystery. <laughs>